Hello. One Great Earth. My name is Dan. I hope you're well. We got a bit to go over today. I try to fit as much climate news as I can possibly fit in these streams. But sometimes it can be difficult or the story that we're going to talk about is complicated and is complex and needs other pieces to sort it out. This is what we do. Curate curate <laughs> uh, climate media and related news and I hope you're doing well I I had my annual psyche bell hearing the state I was in last year around this time between hospitalizations is uh, real eye-opening what medication and therapy can accomplish. Severe ADHD, OCD, and uh, kind of old in my age to be, in my, I usually to be diagnosed as a bipolar type 2. Didn't expect the bipolar type 2 diagnosis, but I can't argue with results because before, I couldn't even show my face on camera. I couldn't talk on camera. I couldn't stream live like this. It wasn't until October I really started being, I felt just comfortable in front of the camera without having to think about it constantly and, and speak. Speak my mind and go over these uh, stories that we usually find ourselves in running out of time constantly because I'll usually, they'll, they'll usually be 40 stories and I'll spend time organizing them and trying to link them together. Uh, let's see here. More Pacific salmon are showing up in Arctic waters. This is from Hatch Mag by Chris Hunt. Climate gates are opening, allowing salmon to migrate to new northern reaches. It would appear that two climactic gates are opening more frequently thanks to abrupt climate change in the Arctic, allowing Pacific salmon to find their way into the Chukchi or and Beaufort seas along the Arctic coast of Canada. Those two seas See, here is Alaska. There. A little better representation. I'm just trying to make it pop on screen up here is the Beaufort Sea and the uh, Chukchi Sea is right here and the Beaufort right here those two seas meet Alaska coast one shares Russian coast For years now, pink, chum, and even sockeye salmon have turned up in subsistence fishing catches by natives in the northern Yukon and northwestern territories. But until recently, these catches were considered rare and credited simply to fish that literally get, got lost at sea. But new research by the University of Alaska Fairbanks and Fisheries and Oceans Canada suggests that climate-driven circumstances are providing an avenue for the expansion of Pacific salmon into Western Canada at an increasing rate. These circumstances, described by researchers as gates, include warm late spring, spring conditions in the Chukchi Sea. Chukchi. 
Chuck Chi. I got it right. Uh, Chuck Chi Sea in the Alaskan Arctic, and then persistent warm temperatures in the Beaufort Sea during the summer. The salmon are able to move in the normally frigid Arctic thanks to the former, the research, the research suggests, and then migrate even fur farther east thanks to the latter. Traditionally, the salmonids found dependently in the Arctic waters of Western Canada and Arctic Alaska were Arctic Char and Dolly Varden, often confused for each other and misidentified by anglers. But in recent years, substance Subsistence. Subsistence fishermen to temperature data recorded in the Chukchi and Beaufort seas over the last two decades, and the warm water spikes in both seas coincides with an increased number of chum, sockeye, and even pink salmon caught in waters where all three fish were previously very rare. So let's see, chum. Okay, and I believe I am back at a brief drop. We'll see how much longer this takes. Uh, waiting for my stream to stabilize. Right now it is all over the place and wonky. I believe it's stabilizing. I lost... Uh, OBS connection for a moment there, I apologize. This is while we're looking at different kinds of salmon. Chum salmon. Sockeye salmon. Yeah, sockeye salmon is the salmon that I think of. When I think of a salmon, I see this. I see that blood red body. Chum salmon is a much lighter body. Stripes, a tiger, snarl. Spotted pink salmon that are striped like the chum, spotted with a huge hump. Peculiar fish, world record salmon that's huge. Dinosaur. Has an iridescence about it. The two gates, warm spring temperatures in the Chutchi and warm summer temperatures in Beaufort, are now opening more frequently and allowing more of the salmon native to the North Pacific Ocean to venture into new waters. You need both gates to be open, which is fascinating in itself. Said Curry Cunningham, an associate professor at UAS College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences. If they don't align in terms of having open, ice-free water, Salmon don't turn that corner.
barring the notion that non-indigenous fish are turning up in Arctic waters of eastern Alaska and western Canada is odd. The next obvious question begs to be asked, is this a bad thing? It really helps to address some questions from community members about biodiversity change and subsistence and how to they feed their families, said Karen Dunmaw, a research scientist with Fisheries and Oceans Canada and the co-lead author of the study. Some years there were salmon, some years there were no salmon. No one really wanted the salmon, but they wanted to know what was going on. For instance, Frankie Dillon, an indigenous fisherman in the Yukon who helped DFO conduct fisheries surveys, recalls catching his first chum salmon in 2010 while tagging Dolly Varden in the Big Fish River. I had to ask, what kind of fish was that? Dillon said one of the chum, Dillon said of the chum salmon. It's the first time I'd seen it in my life. I've only seen it on TV before. The same salmon encroachment is happening in the Arctic waters off the north slope of Alaska. It's not as if though these fish are all skipping Alaska and heading to Canada, said Joe Langdon, a UAF postdoctoral fellow and co-leader of the study with Cunningham. Some of these salmon are ended up in Alaska's north slope too. As salmon numbers continue to flag in the fish's more traditional range in the North Pacific, it would appear that the fish are searching out waters that are at the very least hospitable, given that some of their native waters are much less so today. Considering the well-documented shrinkage of the Bering Sea cold pool and increased flow of water from the Pacific through the Bering Strait, it only makes sense that salmon are following the habitat most suited to their survival. Today, there are numerous documented examples of pink salmon colonizing waters north of the Bering Strait. And it's not just salmon that are turning up in traditionally benthic waters of the Arctic. In recent years, the study says walleye pollock, Greenland halibut, and yellowfin sole, traditional cold water pelagic fish, are turning up in Arctic waters where they are not considered resident fish. But as the study notes, the expansion of salmon into the Alaskan and Canadian Arctic requires a climactic perfect storm where temperatures in both the Chukchi and Beaufort seas must be warm enough at just the right times to allow the fish to comfortably move into new habitat. And according to climate models, the study suggests the occurrence of Pacific salmon in the waters of the western Canadian Arctic will be considered common as soon as the 2040s. Our collaborative approach positions us to document, explore, and explain mechanisms driving changes in fish biodiversity that have the potential to or are already affecting indigenous rights holders in rapidly warming Arctic, the study says. It's from uh, renewaconomy.com.au. Clean energy news and analyses. South Australia locks in federal funds to become first grid in world to reach 100% net wind and solar. South Australia has locked in federal funding to ensure that it becomes the first non-hydro grid in the world to reach 100% net renewables. The funding deal, through what's known as Renewable Energy Transformation Agreement, means that the federal government will underwrite a minimum of 
one gigawatt of new wind and solar generation capacity and another 400 megawatts of storage to ensure it meets its target of 100% net renewables by 2027. South Australia already leads Australia and the world with a wind and solar share of around 70% over the past last 12 months. The addition of the new capacity along with the new Project Energy Connect transmission link from NSW will enable it to become the first in the world to reach 100% 100% net renewables based around wind and solar. That does not mean it will be powered at all times by wind and solar, but the amount of wind and solar generated and stored each year will be equivalent to what it consumes each year. The state will export power at times and import at other times and can fall pack on existing peak gas plants to fill in the gaps. Reaching that milestone will be a landmark for the state and for advocates of the renewable energy transition, particularly as conservative and legacy fossil fuel interests continue to push back on the idea that a modern economy can be powered by renewables and storage. The irony about South Australia is that the target of 100% net renewables was originally committed by the state liberal government. The state labor government merely accelerated it from 2030 to 2027. And to underline the difference in federal politics, the announcement was made at Port Augusta, the site of a former coal-fired power station that the federal coalition wants to turn nuclear, which has already become a hub for green energy and green industry. Would that be Australia's first nuclear power plant? South Australia has been a renewable energy pioneer so much that we recently brought forward our renewable energy target by three years, committing to ensure electricity generation can be sourced from net 100% renewables by 2027. The Energy Minister Tom Coates said in a statement, A lot of battery projects, a lot of solar, a lot of wind. South Australia is reaching 100% renewable energy. Can be done. South Australia has not added a new wind or solar project to the grid for around two years, although the biggest wind project in the state, the 412 megawatt Goiter South Wind Farm, is about to connect and send its first power to the grid. This is interesting. What can be done? Don't believe the lies. Renewable energy can be reality. But how do we fly planes on renewable energy? How do we move hundreds of people in the air on renewable energy. Is solar even possible on an airplane? Is uh, any other renewable energy possible on a plane? But when we talk about carbon budget and we have some 90,000 flights per day in the United States, 
Metal adds up and the carbon budget and increases it, pushes it, pushes it to the limit. South Australia is also building the world's first green hydrogen power plant at Wyala, which will be accompanied by a 250 megawatt green hydrogen electrolyzer and storage facilities, which will also be the world's biggest when complete. The more renewable energy we have in our grid, the more downward pressure it puts on energy bills because it is the cheapest form of energy to power households and industry. Giving the market the confidence to build new projects is good. Signing an agreement to collaborate with South Australia on practical steps to get the best out of the energy transformation of South Australia workers, communities, and industry is great. The Albanese government's reliable renewables plan is the only plan supported by experts to deliver the clean, cheap, reliable, and resilient energy system that Australians deserve. This is in sharp contrast to Peter Dutton's anti-renewables nuclear plan, which remains uncosted and unexplained. As a part of the deal, South Australia will establish its own specific grid reliability mechanism and benchmark to be used and place the national framework and to be responsible for identifying and delivering new projects and technologies that will maintain reliability to that standard. Renew Economy is seeking more information to understand what that means in practice. Speaking of Peter Dutton, D Dutton, U.S. official warns against dropping 2030 climate targets after Dutton refuses to commit to 43% emissions cut. Exclusive. This is from The Guardian, Daniel Hurst. A senior U.S. official has urged Australia and other countries not to back away from their 2030 climate commitments, insisting that we all have a collective responsibility for the planet we live in. The message from Australia's top security ally contrasts with rhetoric from the opposition leader, Peter Dutton, who claimed on Saturday the Labour government was appeasing the international climate lobby and global climate activists. Yeah, global climate activists. I'm sure they have a lot of clout. Dutton has refused to commit to honoring Australia's pledge to cut emissions by 43% by the end of this decade if he wins the next federal election, despite warnings from experts that watering down the target would breach the Paris Climate Agreement. A senior official from the U.S. Department of State told Guardian of Australia it was absolutely important that we keep the 2030 targets viable and said far-sighted politicians would be rewarded for doing the right thing. The official was careful to avoid intervening directly in the Australian domestic political debate, instead expressing the Biden administration's view in global terms and setting out the economic and moral case against delaying climate action. Still, the comments will carry weight in Canberra as they reflect a clear view from Australia's top security ally about ensuring momentum stays in the positive direction in tackling the climate crisis. The U.S. State Department official, who asked not to be named in order to speak more freely, said that everyone on the planet, Americans, Australians, Chinese, must do everything they could to 
keep the Paris Agreement's temperature goals alive. The agreement aims to limit global heating to well below 2 degrees Celsius compared with pre-industrial levels, while countries also promise to pursue efforts to limit to 1.5 degrees Celsius. It was adopted by more than 190 countries, including Australia's then coalition government in 2015. Dutton has claimed Australia's already legislated 2030 target is unachievable, which the government disputes. The U.S. official called for a global effort where the level of motivation needs to stay very high, but also said the biggest economic benefits would flow to those who are moving out quicker on the clean energy transition. I think the deployment of clean technologies is actually unfolding faster than a lot of the cynics thought it might, the official said. The commercial viability really has improved dramatically in recent years. Australia's 2030 target is a cut 43% compared with 2005 emissions on the way to achieving net zero by 2050. The agreement requires that each commitment a country makes will improve on its previous promise and reflect the highest possible ambition. Asked whether backsliding on the 2030 targets was allowed, the U.S. official said, look, every country is going to make their own sovereign decisions, but we all have a collective responsibility for the planet we live in. The official conceded that in any country, domestic politics will veer one way and end then to another, but we just need to make sure that we're all holding ourselves to the highest possible standards. There are good commercial reasons for not wanting to backslide, they said. On Wednesday, when announcing his longer-term nuclear power plan without costings, Dutton was asked whether he would be breaching the Paris obligations. Well, my concern is with residents here in Australia, Dutton said. We'll meet our international obligations. We're committed to Paris. He has previously defended his refusal to commit to 2030 targets. Well, if you look at the United States, the United Kingdom, they're not meeting their targets. Pressed on whether the U.S. would be able to meet its interim target. The State Department officials said the Biden administration was 100% committed to this and had put a huge amount of money where our mouth is through the Inflation Reduction Act. Many climate com campaigners worry about whether the U.S. will continue to show leadership on the issue, particularly with Paris Agreement opponent Donald Trump running to replace Joe Biden. The U.S. has long had nuclear power in its energy mix although it is rapidly ramping up wind and solar projects. Australia and the U.S. continue to collaborate on critical mi mi minerals, with the U.S. official saying, like-mind, like-mind, like-minded? 
countries were looking to rein in their over-dependence on China for nickel, lithium, cobalt, and copper. You just don't want to go too many more years where we remain fundamentally dependent on a single source for this building block of basically the next generation of energy that we're all going to be depending on, the official said. Oh, this guy sucks. How would anybody vote for him? I don't. The number of migrants who have died attempting to cross the U.S.-Mexico border has increased over the past few years. U.S. officials say extreme summer heat is a contributing factor. The fire department in the small border city of Sunland Park, New Mexico, says it's overwhelmed with calls to rescue migrants. NPR Sergio Martinez Beltran spent two days with the firefighters to bring us this story. The Sunland Park Fire Department is relatively quiet on a recent Friday afternoon, but when the radio goes off, firefighters freeze. I think it's going to be a female subject, possibly um, undocumented. Yep. The firemen jump on their trucks and head to the scene. The dispatcher says a woman in her late 20s is in distress. They drive to a neighborhood near the border where they spot the woman sitting up against a stop sign. She's surrounded by neighbors and by local police. A firefighter calls her name, Julissa, and asks her if she knows where she's at or what happened to her. He picked up her name from an Ecuadorian passport she was carrying. She's 28 years old. Yeah, she hasn't said anything to us yet. She's unresponsive, a police officer tells the firefighters. Her eyes are open, but they are glazed. She's lethargic. Firefighters pour cold water over her. 359. 359 BGL. BGL 359. Her blood glucose level is high, a sign of dehydration. Eventually, Julissa is put in an ambulance and sent to a nearby hospital. Scenes like this have become an everyday occurrence here, Captain Abraham Garcia with the Sunland Park Fire Department says. Yeah, it's, it's been tasking on our, on our resources, on our personnel, but you know, that's just the game that we're in today. Sunland Park is part of the El Paso Border Patrol sector, which includes parts of Texas and New Mexico. In this sector, migrant deaths have more than doubled from 2022 to 2023, according to U.S. Customs and Border Protection. This year, extreme heat and more restrictive border policies could lead to more deaths. Orlando Marrero Rubio is a Border Patrol spokesperson in this area. Well, we've seen here in the, in the sector relating to heat-related illnesses and rescues it's a rise on migrants that are being left behind by human smugglers. In these areas, temperatures can reach up to 120 degrees, sending migrants into heat exhaustion. Many Border Patrol agents are certified emergency medical technicians, but because of the high numbers of migrants crossing, local fire departments have to also assist. This has pushed the Sunland Park Fire Department to shift gears, says Captain Abraham Garcia. As the years have gone by and we started seeing this uptick in, in migrant uh, calls, we had to change our tactics a little bit, learn new stuff, new strategies, new tactics, so we can better help these people. During the two days NPR spent with the Sunland Park Fire Department, nearly 10 migrants were helped. That included a group of six migrants, many of them from Ecuador. 
they had to be put in ice baths and given emergency care. Maria, abre los ojos, okay? ¿Cómo se siente? Mejor. A firefighter asks one of the migrants to keep her eyes open. He says her name is Maria, and she's a 32-year-old from Ecuador. Another man was rescued later that evening near an industrial park. Paramedics told NPR the person was a 21-year-old from Mexico, but didn't provide a full name. He had a body temperature of 107 degrees. In the ambulance, he was gasping for air. At the hospital, he was intubated. As of the airing of this piece, it is uncertain if he or any of the others recovered. Sergio Martinez Beltran, NPR News, Sundland Park, New Mexico. And now more from N. Sundland Park, New Mexico. Quarter town firefighters scramble to save migrants from extreme summer heat. Is a story that we just listened to on NPR. Let's see what else we got here today. Alberta firefighters facing challenging conditions as heat wave sweeps Western Canada. A high of 34 Celsius is expected for the Fort McMurray forest area Tuesday. Sweltering conditions from a heat wave gripping Western Canada are presenting challenging conditions for firefighters in northern Alberta on Tuesday. Wildfire dangers spread across Alberta over the weekend with extreme temperatures and out of control fires in the northern areas of the province. This is uh, carbon monoxide. I wonder if those are fires here. Massive indications. It's uh, sweltering conditions, indeed. No evacuation orders have been declared as of 10 a.m. Tuesday. This is Alberta here. Very high, very extreme fire dangers all across the province. A high of 34 C is expected for the Fort McMurray Forest area Tuesday. You looking at satellites from the area, see if we can see any smoke.
massive warnings. Massive, massive, very high to extreme fire weather danger in Alberta. The out of control Cattail Lake Complex fire is located roughly 8 kilometers northeast of industrial facilities and about 50 kilometers northeast of Fort McKay and 70 kilometers northeast of Fort McMurray. It covers about 14,000 hectares. As of Tuesday morning, 195 people were working on fires in the area, including 89 firefighters, 17 helicopters completing bucketing operations, and 36 heavy equipment groups working on day and night operations. Minimal fire behavior was observed on Monday. Oil sands precautions. Zenovis Energy said Monday, it is demobilizing some staff at its Sunrise Oil Sands project as a precaution due to the evolving wildfire situation. Sunrise, which produced about 49,000 barrels per day last year, is about 60 kilometers northeast of Fort McMurray. Zenovis said its operations remain unaffected, but staff who are not directly involved in operations at Sunrise are being demobilized. We are in close contact with provincial and municipal agencies and supporting their aid for efforts in the area. Last week, Suncor Energy shut down its 215,000 barrel per day fire bag oil sand site and curtailed some production due to the wildfires. Three big fires. A wildfire alert was issued by Little Red River Cree Nation just after 1 p.m. Mountain Time Monday for the community of Garden River. Heavy rains halt search for 30 people missing in Indonesia landslide that killed at least 23. From AP News, Muhammad Tafon and Nainiak Karmini. Palo, Indonesia. Incessant rains Wednesday halted the search for 30 people believed trapped under a landslide that engulfed an unauthorized gold mine on Indonesia's Sulawesi Island. Sulawesi. Sulawesi Island over the weekend, killing at least 23 people. More than 100 villagers were digging for grains of gold on Sunday in the remote and hilly village of Bone Malango in Gorontalo province where when tons of mud plunged down the surrounding hills and buried their makeshift camps. Search was suspended Wednesday afternoon due to heavy rains. 
Rescuers had not yet been able to locate the missing people, he said. The National Search and Rescue Agency said Wednesday that 92 villagers managed to escape from the landslide. Several of them were pulled out by rescuers, including 18 with injuries. It said 23 bodies were recovered, including that of a four-year-old boy, while 30 people were missing. More than 1,000 personnel, including Army troops, have now been deployed in the search, said E.D. Rakaso, the agency's operation director. He said the Indonesian Air Force would send a helicopter to speed up the rescue operation, which has been hampered by heavy rains, unstable soil, and rugged terrain. Photos released by the agency showed an excavator removing tons of mud and rock that blocked access to the site. Informal mining operations are common in Indonesia, providing a tenuous livelihood for thousands laboring in conditions that pose a high risk of serious injury or death. Landslides, flooding, and collapses of tunnels are just some of the hazards facing miners. Much of the gold ore processing involves highly toxic mercury and cyanide with workers frequently using little or no protection. The country's last major mining related incident accident occurred in April 2022 when a landslide crashed onto an illegal gold mine in North Sumatra's Mandaling Natal district, killing 12 women who were looking for gold. Environmental activists have campaigned for years to shut down operations across the country especially on Sulawesi, where the practice has grown. Sunday's landslide reignited their calls. The local government, which has allowed illegal gold mining activities in this area to continue, has contributed to the deadly disaster, said Muhammad Jamil, who heads the legal division of the Mining Advocacy Group Network and Environmental Watchdog. He said, many people share the blame for illegal gold mining. From those working on the ground up to the to officials in the local council and the police. This mafia network appears to have helped shield the miners from law enforcement, even as they tear up protected forests, Emil said. When natural resources such as rivers, forests, land, and the sea are damaged, it will be a complete loss to the country's economy. Ferdy Hassaman, a mining and energy researcher at Alpha Research and Data Center, said the proliferation of pit mines has long been blamed for environmental damage in upstream areas that has in turn exacerbated flooding and landslides downstream. Flash floods and landslides would persist if illegal mining and deforestation in the practice continue, he said, Hassaman said. We can call, we call on the local and central government to expand their efforts to shut down illegal gold mining across the country. Tragic. A lot of people perished as a result of this landslide. It is a tragedy. Yeah, this, this is a tragedy. Four-month-old baby dies on boating trip during 120-degree heat over 4th of July weekend. Lake Havasu, Arizona. A four-month-old baby died from heat-related complications following a boating trip in Arizona 
over 4th of July weekend. According to the Mojave County Sheriff's Office, the family was boating on Lake Havasu when the baby became unconscious around 5.10 p.m. on Friday. According to AccuWeather, the area hit record temperatures reaching a high of 120 degrees. An excessive heat warning was issued. A GoFundMe page created for the family. This is tragic. Four month old baby. A GoFundMe page identified the baby as four month old Anna Ray Robelski. Our precious baby girl gave us her last smiles and we gave her our last kisses. We will never understand why you had to leave us so soon. You were just too perfect. Go find me, page reads. Donna's mother, Alyssa Robleski, posted a tribute to her daughter on Facebook. The commentators were quick question why a four-month-old baby was on a boat in 120 degree heat. I honestly can't even find the words to express my feelings right now. This is just devastating. One Facebook commenter wrote, what were you thinking? There was an excessive heat warning that day, extremely careless and irresponsible. I just can't imagine taking the four-month-old baby out in extreme heat wave. Poor sweet little girl who needlessly suffered because of poor parental decisions. Another Facebook user commented. Detectives are still investigating. It's unclear if Tana's parents will be facing charges. Heat is a silent killer. Heat builds up. After a certain point, you don't get the benefit of sweating. And the ambient air temperature around you doesn't give the benefit of cooling. Whirl. The Robelskis experienced the unthinkable. Enjoying a family day on the lake turned into the most unimaginable day of their lives. Tana lost consciousness and they immediately started CPR. Lake Havasu City Fire Department quickly arrived to take over life-saving procedures. Tana was rushed to Havasu Regional Medical Center where they continued to work on her to get a pulse. She was then airlifted to the Phoenix Children's Hospital where they did everything in their power to revive her. God had other plans and took Tana to heaven that night. So senseless.
Elf, child star Benji Gregory dies of suspected heat stroke in his car in Arizona, sister says. Benji Gregory, the child actor who starred in the 1980s sitcom Elf, has died at the age of 46, according to his sister. He was so young still. Still so young. Gregory was found dead along with his service dog oh, in his car on June 13th. His sister, Rebecca Herzog, passenger, wrote on Facebook. His vehicle was in a bank parking lot in Priora, Arizona, the New York Times reported. Hertzberg Paffinger, 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 said the family believes he went there the evening of June 12th to deposit some residual checks found in his vehicle, but never got out of the car to do so. He fell asleep and died from vehicular heat stroke, she wrote. At the time, Arizona was in the midst of a heat wave with a high of 108 recorded June 12th uh, and 111 degrees recorded June 13th, according to AccuWeather. Ben was a great son, brother, and uncle. He was fun to be around and made us laugh quite often. Still going through his things, I find myself laughing at little videos or notes of his in between crying. His sister wrote, Maricopa County Medical Examiner record records show he died June 13th with a manner in a death and primary cause of death was pen are pending. Gregory was known for playing the bright-eyed Brian Tanner on Elf, which aired from 1986 to 1990. The show followed the story of a furry alien dubbed Elf, short for alien life form from the planet Melmac who crash-landed into the Tanner's garage in California and was taken in by the family. Gregory was born Benjamin Gregory Hertzberg in Encino, California on May 26, 1978, according to his IMDb profile. He grew up on camera, appearing in commercials, and went on to guest star shows like The A-Team and The Twilight Zone, and appeared in the movies like the 1986 Jumping Jack Flash, Whoopi Goldberg, and the 1991 movie Never Forget. However, he stopped acting around the end of the 90s. He went on to join the U.S. Navy, serving as Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi, his IMDb profile said. His sister told the Times he lived with bipolar disorder and depression, and had received care for both. As a, someone that's struggled with mental health. Struggling with their own mental health. As uh, I was just recently diagnosed as uh, bipolar type 2 disorder. It's dangerous out there. Heat. Very dangerous and it builds up over time. And takes you away. He never made it out of his vehicle. Very tragic. Very tragic. Heat related deaths. Reminds me a lot of Early COVID with coast, coast, people succumbing to disease, to illness, as it made its way further inland. People dying, rising numbers. It just takes one blackout, cause 
a mass casualty event in some of these areas. People in a vehicle, like, did he have his car on? Did he? How long was he in the vehicle for before he succumbed? Why wouldn't he write the checks out in the bank? At least leaves the AC on in the car. This is just so tragic. I, I just, I'm having a hard time moving past this story. One month older than this it is tragic. He is a silent killer. It builds up and causes great harm. Please take care of yourselves out there. This temperature that we're seeing, especially in the southwest, to me it's just absolutely delirious. The temperature is over 110 degrees in such wide swaths of the country. Not any better where I live. But it's, uh, he was only 46 years old. It's gonna happen to anyone. It's gonna happen to any of us. We're not careful. We don't take care. I was hospitalized twice last year for episodes and depression. I'm probably, I just can't like, Hundreds succumb to extreme temperatures as severe heat wave engulfs Pakistan. The country grapple, grapples with challenges posed by climate change. This May and June, Pakistan faced an unusual heat wave that has claimed hundreds of lives. The extreme temperatures, especially in Karachi and surrounding areas, have overwhelmed healthcare systems and emergency services. As the global climate crisis worsens, Pakistan stands at the forefront of climate change impacts. Pakistan witnessed unusually wet weather in March and April this year, a phenomenon not seen since 1961. According to a report by the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs since April 12, 2024, 124 people, including women and children, have died. 
153 people have been injured during floods and over 6,000 houses have been damaged with flood water across Pakistan. Two rounds of heat waves. In May, the climate took an extreme swing. The PMD and NDMA issued their first advisory stating that the provinces of Punjab and Sindh would face a heat wave from May 23rd to 27th, with temperatures expected to rise to approximately 45 degrees Celsius or above. In a span of six days, over 568 people died, with 141 succumbing to the heat on June 25th alone. Yes. So much tragedy. This heat killer. Usually, the summer break in school starts in June, but due to rising temperatures, the government orders schools to shut down early to protect children from heat stroke and dehydration. As hospitals began to feel with heat stroke patients across the two provinces, heat wave units were also established. I thank you if you're just now joining me. Even if you're watching this on replay, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. If you haven't already, please give me a follow on Twitch. I appreciate it greatly. Thank you so much. Heat wave and their impact. This is... Heat waves result from warm air being trapped in the atmosphere for many days. Large urban areas face challenges related to heat trapped in the area due to the concentrated release of heat from buildings, vehicles, and industry. According to the World Health Organization, exposure to such high temperatures causes heat exhaustion and heat stroke, a condition that causes faintness and dry, warm skin due to the body's inability to control high temperatures among other symptoms. It can cause severe dehydration, acute cerebrovascular cerebrovascular accidents and contribute to thrombo thrombogenesis or uh, blood clots. Thrombosis. Um, from from Bosis. Globally, heat waves are increasing in intensity and frequency due to climate change resulting from greenhouse gas emissions. This prolonged heat entrapment leads to devastating devastation of flood crops and food shortages. There's so much tragedy happening. I worry so much, people I know, in this heat. It only goes down like 10 degrees at night where I am. I can't imagine it being triple digits and that happening. It's just no relief.
We're in trouble. And for the people that make these decisions that could affect climate change, they're not going to do the right thing. There's not going to be drastic, dramatic changes, because there would have been already if that were the case. We're already seeing records being broken all over the place. Not a question if a city or a state has seen temperatures like this before. It's solely due to the speed at which we're seeing temperatures change, fluctuate, and remain very high. The heat causes glacial lake outburst flooding. That's when uh, an iceberg or a glacier starts bleeding out its fresh water. It is terrible. People that have to work out in this weather, I, I don't know how they survive. This um, triple digit heat that people have to just deal with, it builds up in the body and it's a silent killer. It just claps and faints. Reminds me a lot of early COVID. Just passing out and falling, collapsing. Not being able to be resuscitated. Uh, we've been covering the last little while these uh, climate change lawsuits that have been going on. This is Marathon Oil reaches $241 million settlement with EPA for environmental violations in North Dakota. The federal government announced a $241.5 million settlement with Marathon Oil on Thursday for alleged air quality violations at the company's oil and gas operations in the 4th Burfold Indian Reservation in North Dakota. The Environmental Protection Agency and Department of Justice said the settlement requires Marathon to reduce climate and health harming emissions from those facilities and will result in over 2.3 million tons worth of pollution reduction. This historic settlement, the largest ever civil penalty for violations of the Clean Air Act at stationary sources, will ensure cleaner air for the fort. Fairfold Indian Reservation and other communities in North Dakota while holding Marathon accountable for its illegal pollution, said Attorney General Merrick B. Garland. Marathon officials did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Houston-based Marathon operates 169 well pads in North Dakota, where the company extracts oil and natural gas. While Marathon is the country's 22nd largest oil producer based on the 2022 data, the federal agency said it's also the seventh largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions in the oil and gas industry. Much of its emissions come from flaring, the industry practice of burning off waste gases, which also releases methane, a particular potent contributor to climate change. The settlement calls for Marathon to eliminate the equivalent of over 
and a quarter million tons of carbon dioxide emissions over the next five years, which the agency said was tantamount to taking 487,000 cars off the road for one year and will also eliminate nearly 110,000 tons of volatile organic compound emissions. emissions. The agency said the case is the first of its kind against an oil and gas producer for violations of major source emissions permitting requirements under the Clean Air Act's Prevention of, of Significant Deterioration Program. They also said it's the largest ever penalty imposed for stationary source violations which, records, which, which include facilities such as oil and gas tank systems. The complaint alleged that these and other Clean Air Act violations at nearly 90 marathon facilities resulted in thousands of tons of illegal pollution. The settlement is part of a lawsuit and consent decree officially filed Thursday in federal court in North Dakota. Gaza. Israel continues military assault across Gaza. At least 38,345 people have been killed, including more than 14,000, I'm sorry, more than 15,000 children. Over 88,000 have been injured, and more than 10,000 missing in the rubble. reason we talk about Gaza right now so the Lancet Lancet published Gaza numbers and they're stating 186,000 dead in Gaza. A credible estimate according to doctors of the world It's over four times the amount uh, that has been reported. So what does this change? If the amount that we're faced with is actually far greater than the number that we've been dealing with, from 38,000 dead, instead now possibly 186,000 people in Gaza die. The amount of people that are in the rubble is they're getting bulldozed around. They're not. Their survivors aren't being checked under the rubble. People can survive under the rubble for some time too. So they just get bulldozed. And these bulldozers aren't normal bulldozers that you would see they are war dozers
Disastrous fruit and vegetable crops must be wake of a call for UK, says farmers. Next government urged to have a proper plan for food security as UK's climate becomes more unpredictable. This image here, Brussels sprouts being harvested in a flooded field near Boston, Lincolnshire in April. UK fruit and vegetable production has plummeted as farms have been hit by extreme weather. The country suffered the wettest 18 months since record began across the 2023-2024 growing year, leaving soil waterlogged and some farms totally underwater. The impacts on harvest have been disastrous. Data from the Department for Environment food and rural affairs shows that year-on-year -year vegetable yields decreased by 4.9% to 2.2 million tons in 2023, and the production volumes of fruit decreased by 12% to 585,000 tons. Scientists say that climate breakdown caused by the burning of fossil fuels is likely to bring more extreme weather to the UK, including more frequent floods and droughts. Farmers said that they were not able to plant due to wet weather, and this is born in the statist out in the statistics. The growing area of vegetables was down by 6.5% to 101,000 hectares. A dry early summer in 2023 also did not help, as those who could not irrigate found it hard to plant. Wet weather in the autumn and winter meant that the planted area of Brassicas decreased by 3.1% to 23,000 hectares. There's a lot of numbers, a lot of numbers. Madness. Crops completely underwater and ruined. That sad picture is just alarming. UK is having a bad run. Greek islands face water shortage at the height of tourist season. Many Greek islands are facing water shortages and local authorities are thinking about limiting consumption even though the tourist season is just right around the corner, according to Reuters reports. On the island of Naxos, halfway between Athens and Crete, the main water reservoir has almost completely dried up in the summer heat, threatening local agriculture. On the island of Carpathos, between Crete and Rhodes, Local authorities have imposed restrictions on the filling of pools 
and on several other island afford, islands authorities want to buy plants to convert seawater into fresh water to cope with the shortage. Large parts of the country have not had full rainfall for months, and the dry spring and summer were preceded by the warmest winter in history. The difficult water situation becomes an even greater challenge, as the country is now seeing a massive influx of tourists, an important source of income for local businesses, which means increased consumption. This is uh, Jamaica. Power outages impacting water supply to some customers in St. Catherine and Kingston. Areas impacted, yeah. Mass power outages due to the storms. Uh, Hurricane Barrel. This is, uh, just as the temperature climbs, Texas towns are closing public pools to cut costs. Because they are saying that, uh, splash pads are a more affordable option, and that the repairs to the shell in the inside of the, the pools, the cost is far greater than it is to just wreck it. Raising of the Longview Swim Center began this month, leaving one public pool option for a city of 80,000 people. It is the third pool abandoned and demolished by the city in the last 20 years and comes after the city stopped providing swimming lessons in 2020. The Bach and Longview are just two examples seen across Texas where the cost of producing, providing a public pool has outpaced the ability of local municipalities to pay for them. Swimming pools across Texas and the United States are closing in swaths. Pools that have long or gone necessary maintenance are now too costly to repair, so cities are demolishing them. Splash pads are becoming the cheaper alternative. They require less maintenance and staff for the most part. Residents say they aren't against the splash pads, but they don't fill the gaps left by abandoned swimming pools. And splash pads don't appeal to all age groups, and they can be less accessible to differently abled individuals. In their heyday, Lubbock's city-owned pools were the ideal outing for residents. Flat Pool was the largest and most popular. Nearly 20,000 residents visited the pool every year, according to city data. This summer, the 
pool is an empty relic from Lebuck's past. The pools were centrally located. The city's only pool, uh, remaining pool, is not open this year. How are you supposed to enjoy a splash pad in a wheelchair? A splash pad doesn't replace a pool, Atkinson said. But we have something now. There are benefits to the splash pads, Atkinson said. They'll be open for eight months of the year. All have unique and different features, and the water is recycled through the pads after it's sterilized. They also don't require staff, a growing problem across the U.S. According to the American Lifeguard Association, one third of the remaining 309,000 public swimming pools nationwide remain closed in 2023 as a result of low staffing. The biggest benefit to splash pads are free to the public. There's a picture of the pool being torn apart. I have less and less people that know how to swim. As pools have closed, drownings have risen, according to the Centers for Disease Control. More than 4,500 people drowned each year from 2020 to 2022, 500 more people per year compared to reports from 2019 and earlier. More than 40 million adults don't know how to swim. Knowing how to swim, I, I, I can't imagine not being able to know how to swim, how to keep my head above water. I just sink. I don't get it. Just flap your hands and feet.
Let's take a look. Sea ice conditions. Year to date. It's a, ha it's a massive decrease of sea ice in the north. There's a staggering loss of sea ice in the uh, North Pole and the Arctic. Huge, staggering, stunning losses of sea ice and also Most of it was dead. Scientists discover one of Great Barrier Reef's worst coral bleaching events. This is from June 25th by Graham Redfern from The Guardian. At least 97% of corals on a reef in the Great Barrier Reef's north died during one of the, wor one of the worst coral bleaching events the world's biggest reef system has ever seen. All that yellow, orange, and red, that's all coral bleaching. It's happening all across the globe, and it's happening now in the Northeast hard. Like, this is very concerning here, in the Northeast. We came out of the water and didn't know what to say. It's an iconic reef and most of it was dead. July 3rd, Benjamin Shingler at CBC Canada. Coral reefs are vital lines of defense against hurricanes, but their future is in doubt. How coral reefs protect the coastline. 
Jennifer Kloss, who studies coral reef preservation, described a healthy coral reef as nature's seawall. You've got this massive bulwark that essentially acts like a big source of friction and slows waves down, busts them up, and prevents a lot of the energy from reaching the shore, eroding the shore, and damaging the infrastructure behind it as it costs. Director of the Coral Reef Conservation Program at the United States National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. Research suggests coral reefs can potentially reduce wave energy by up to 97%. For that reason, they are flat out essential in protecting low lying islands from damage. Michael Risk, Professor Emeritus of Earth, Environment and Society at McMaster University, said in an email. Studies have also shown coral reefs have the capacity for regrowth if they are damaged during storms and for growing upward to protect against rising sea levels. Mass bleaching. What coral reefs are struggling to deal with unprecedented ocean heat. Nearly all of the coral reefs in the Atlantic off the Florida coast and the Caribbean have been hit with severe losses. NOAA confirmed a global mass bleaching event in April. When those bleaching events last too long, the tissue dies and you see this stark white skeleton. Because, um, bleaching and coral reef is heat stroke to a human being. If corals don't have enough time to recover from mass bleaching events, we're sort of over time losing that really valuable structure, that not only for coastal protection, but for biodiversity, food security, and the other myriad ecosystem services that corals provide. Risks set warm ocean temperatures and land-based pollution put coral reefs future in doubt. He said after corals die, the structure remains in place for a decade at most. Researchers are working to prevent bleaching, in some cases Koss said by physically shading the waters above coral reefs. Koss said a hurricane or tropical storm can also help cool the water and ease pressure on coral reefs, provided the storm isn't too powerful and doesn't hit them directly. As a conser conservationist, it's really kind of crazy to be praying for some kind of storm event or prolonged cloud exposure in order to break up the impacts of a bleaching event. Fueled by record warm waters, this year's hurricane season, which runs from June 1st to November 30th, is forecast to be far busier than usual. This is... Coral, bleached coral, when it loses its algae, causes heat stroke in the coral, and it loses its essence, and it just rots. I wonder if we've seen in a lab how coral reefs regenerate, recover. I hope that's been noted. That would be promising to know that even in a lab, that bleached coral reef can be recovered. Vital, vital importance. Coral bleachings devastate Bali reefs as sea temperatures rise. Bondalem, Indonesia conservationist Neoman Sagiarto has been working for 16 years to preserve coral on the reefs of Bali, but the frequency of mass coral bleaching, he says, is now devastating. 90% of the corals 
Figuerato had nurtured on the reefs near his village and fondled them in the north shores of Bali, lost their color last December. It was all white. We were shocked. And of course, it also natively affected the coral we planted. It's just not the natural ones, 51 year old Sugiarto told Reuters. When Sugiarto began coral conservation projects in 2008, he was told that coral could retain the living algae, which gives it color for 10 to 20 years. Yet the coral reefs off Bondolem were bleached in less than 10 years, he says, blaming warmer sea temperatures triggered by climate change. Coral bleaching occurs when coral expels the colorful algae living in its tissues. Without the algae, the coral becomes pale and vulnerable to starvation, disease, or death. In April, the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration said more than 54% of the reef areas in the world's Oceans are experiencing bleaching level heat stress in the, the fourth global bleaching event in the last three decades. Indonesia accounts for 18% of the world's total coral reefs. I thank you so much for joining me, even if you're watching this on replay. If you could please click the follow button. I am starting over on Twitch. I had 6,500 subscribers on YouTube, but YouTube has made it extremely difficult and complicated because they have just a series of landmines that you don't know where they are. I don't know if I did something or said something wrong in videos that I was reported, but eventually my account was locked, not locked, um, suspended. My ads account was suspended. And uh, it just seems like anything that I do on YouTube, I get hit with something. And it's been very frustrating. So going forward, I want to stream live on Twitch and then upload that video on YouTube afterwards. I feel that would be better because I don't want to dedicate. I don't. I looked into restreaming, and uh, that's a subscription based, which I'm not uh, going to take a subscription based uh, add on right now. I believe it's 20 bucks a month or something like that for a restream. If my numbers were higher, I would definitely do something like that and try to restream to uh, as many uh, platforms as I can. But as of right now, just uh, streaming on Twitch and then uploading it onto YouTube. Because YouTube has been very strange. I haven't had many uh, views lately. Usually like, you know, like 10 to 20, 30 or so. Uh, but it was after they suspended my ads account and everything happened that I started noticing this sharp decline in viewership. Or whatever happened, it caused the channel to get out of the loop, out of the recommendation for people. I'm not sure. But I do know that going forward, I will be live with Twitch every day at 5.30 p.m. Try to be at 5.30 p.m. Might be a little early, might be a little early. Like today, I believe I was a little early. That's fine. That's why we have an intro now. You heard the intro song that is me playing. It, it must be nice you know, to <laughs> be able to make your own intro music. I think every show needs its own music, right? To intro. Maybe an exit song will be one day, but right now I'm just trying to see where I can take this channel. 
as if I had uh, at one point over 6,500 subscribers on YouTube. I am starting over on Twitch. I would appreciate it very much if you're watching this on YouTube on repeat that you go over to Twitch uh, dot, uh, at uh, One Great Earth and click the follow button. I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Now, is that the end of this article? That was the end of the article. I would like to also take a moment to introduce my Patreon account. Patreon.com slash One Great Earth. I started the Patreon account when, uh, YouTube suspended my ads account because uh, I don't I don't I haven't been monet I haven't been able to monetize anything yet on YouTube and the monetization part of it looks like it's gone down because um, without the views I'm not going to be able to get the amount of watch time needed to you know super chats and stuff like that um, and it's just taking forever and these last hurdles that YouTube put in front of me, you know, just too many. All I want to do is just do a stream, get in and get out, without having to worry about trying to contact YouTube support for the fifth time. About why they're blocking a video, why they suspended a stream, why are they doing what they do? So far, um, Twitch has been a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. Not saying that it was going to be difficult, but uh, I was just so used to the back end of YouTube that I didn't really think about the difference in how convenient it is on Twitch. It, it's, it is good. And I'm happy to make the transition. And eventually I would like to, multi, uh, to restream on multiple platforms at a time. That would that would take a lot. I'm not sure. If you could go to my Patreon, I do have a free membership tier. If you would click that at the very minimum, I would greatly appreciate it. There's also a $5 a month tier, and I would like to thank my headliners now. I would like to thank John, Sarah, Ashley, and Michonne. Thank you so much for your support. It means the world to me. Right now, Oh, that's the other thing. I was, um, my YouTube account was suspended, or not suspended, was uh, demonetized going forward due to circumventing systems and shocking content. I'm not sure what the shocking content was or the circumventing systems. Uh, tried talking to YouTube or uh, Google support, uh, got nowhere. Maybe eventually I'll be able to resolve it, but until then, uh, YouTube won't be my focus. I thought YouTube would have been a better fit as a podcast. And for a while, it looked like it was catching on. I had some videos that had a couple thousand views. But it's just getting to the point that I had to make a change. And uh, which it is for now. Like Facebook Live and other services, I'm not sure about yet. That would be probably in like the restream idea because I, I don't want to have to upload the video in three different ways afterwards.
What else we got in here? What else we got? New York Bridge gets stuck after opening, stuck open after getting too hot. You shall see it's gotten too hot. Bridge connects the uh, Bronx to Manhattan. Let's see. Las Vegas hits record a fifth consecutive day of 115 degrees or greater as heat wave scorches the United States. I'm sure this temperature hasn't changed. There's Las Vegas, 116 degrees, 120 degrees, 118 degrees. We're in trouble. These are temperatures that are not sustainable. The wear and tear on even train tracks alone due to this immense, enormous heat is warping them. is very alarming and we're seeing heat related deaths and illnesses all across the world all the, wo the world just the united states is one of the things that i'm trying to establish here is that not just us everyone across the planet is suffering right now it seems like there's no winter Midwest had a very mild winter and didn't even have any lake ice in the Great Lakes. That's huge. And we're seeing temperatures in the Southwest over 115 degrees Fahrenheit. This is, this is not good. Temperatures are rising all across the board. Wildfires and red flag alerts. Speaking of red flag, let's take a look. Tomorrow's outlook of fire weather. Uh, elevated. Dry thunder. And soil. Struck by lightning. Dried out even further. Really hope the best for people. Really hope that they're able to beat the heat and this isn't as much of a killer as we've been reading. But we know that that's not the case. It is alarming, these temperatures that we're seeing, and how quick people 
are to what's a good way to put it lie to themselves about climate change and what's going on right now we're not talking about just individual cities we're talking about swaths of the planet that are experiencing extreme heat if nothing I want people to take away from these uh, from this, these these streams is that you're not alone. Climate crisis is happening all across the planet, and it's just endless amounts of news coming out of different parts of the world of different consequences of climate change. One thing is. To note is that fresh water will evaporate, will vanish, as we've been seeing. When you hear of water problems, we will report it. Now, Now this is um, not related to climate change, but um, this woman, actress, Shelley Duvall, she passed away today at 75 years old due to uh, complications due to diabetes. Now the reason I bring her up in her death today is because she was very mentally unwell. And she didn't get help until much later in life. If it didn't, if uh, her mental health started to deteriorate, she was actually homeless for a while, multiple times. Like, He suffered greatly from mental illness, something that I can relate to. I was hospitalized twice last year. I know it's something people don't like hearing or something people don't like discussing is mental health and mental well-being, something that even I take seriously, but even still You can't be it. You need help. The best advice I can give is I did not seek help until my 30s. It wasn't for a while that I got on medication and therapy that helped me greatly. And realized just how much more I could have been doing in my life. But OCD, ADHD, and the highs and lows of mania, depression, just makes things difficult. There's a lot of factoring against success. Because I can find success, but it's diminishing returns. It's the nature of the illness. 
before Shelly Duvall because uh, she was the right actress. She left Hollywood and never looked back. And then it wasn't until later that she came out for asking for help and she was I believe in her 60s. In November 2016, a disheveled Duvall appeared on an episode of syndicated talk show Dr. Phil and revealed that she was suffering from mental illness. I am very sick. I need help, she said. I don't want to show the last picture of her, but there is her last picture. Is that mine? I can't find it. But I did see it, I know I saw it. She's 75 years old. Suffered a lot. She suffered a lot. Very sad. She... She was one of a kind. Anybody who's seen The Shining or any of the Altman movies that she was in, you know that she was a strong woman. She withstood Stanley Kubrick's barrage and onslaught of commands and demands. She was very strong. Died in her sleep due to complications of diabetes. She was very mentally unwell for a very long time. Longer than probably asked for help. If you're struggling and suffering, please know that you're not alone. Reach out, talk to somebody. I I didn't. I waited until it was so bad that I required hospitalization. I didn't know how common it was to lose yourself, to suddenly not know what to do next, what what to do. Get to a certain point that you're starting to reflect on life and. Depending on I, I digress, I'm sorry. I'm getting a little too carried away. There's a lot of stories of mental illness today having uh suffered greatly. They'll tell you that when I was going to school in high school and middle school, I was sleeping all the time in class. I kept my head down. That wasn't me. I was sick. And I went undiagnosed for a very long time. Through a lot of caffeine and I used to work two to three jobs at a time. I don't know how I did it. I would just work. Work all day. Work all night. I used to work at a JC Penny during the morning. And then I would go work at a movie theater from like 4 p.m. to 1 a.m. or something like that and then I would go home go to sleep wake up go back to JCPenney for another shift then go to the theater for a shift don't know how I did it thinking back now it's complicated thinking back about where I was and what position I was in and why didn't my parents, why weren't they ever told that I was literally sleeping through classes all the time. They had no idea what was going on with me in school. They just thought that it was fine. But I was sick. It wasn't anybody's fault. But it went undiagnosed for too long. 
and I don't know where I could have been, you know, that you can't fight that thought. It's going to take over. You just have to let it. You have to let questions roll over you, or they'll take you down. It's not, not fair. When I say I could only really interact with people online because it would take me a moment sometimes to react or I would just be stationary. I would be a shambling corpse. I would be not okay. I wouldn't really be myself. That's sad. I feel a lot of people never got to experience me. Unless you're, unless you spent a lot of time around me, you wouldn't get through that. That wall there. Rest in peace, Shelley Duvall. Dies at 75 years old. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for joining me here. I don't wish to leave it such a somber uh, note, but that is all the time we have for today. I thank you very much for joining me, even if you're watching this on replay. Thank you very much. I appreciate the support. I will be I will be back tomorrow with another stream at 5:30 p.m. Eastern. I'm trying to maintain a schedule of 5:30 p.m. every day. Thank you very much for joining me. Please take care.